Welcome to Stories from the Center of the Universe, the podcast about the human experience. Jamie Grant, welcome to the Center of the Universe. Thanks for being here. Thank you. We're excited uh, because you're bringing a business to town. Yes. yes. What is the name of your business? Foodio. Uh, so Foodio is the official name, but since we're moving into Ashland Coffee and Tea, I decided Foodio at Ashland Coffee and Tea. Okay, nice. Yeah. And Foodio exists today in Tappahannock. Yes. All right, so tell me about what Foodio is in Tappahannock. So we're a non-traditional farmer's market. So mm. most people think farmer's market, they think outside, lots of vendors, and that's kind of what we do. But we focus on empowering people through food. So we do a ton of food education, both online and in person, um, at the market and in churches, organizations. Um, and we provide education basically on how to prepare food, how to buy food. You'd be surprised how many people go into a grocery store and only buy frozen, so they don't know how to buy fresh by the pound. Um, and how many people can't read and write. Mm. Um, so. Everything from preparing food in a microwave to a stove or a deep fryer um, and providing affordable food. So we have memberships available that help to keep the food costs low. We grow a lot of our food. And then we have vendors from dog treat makers to farmers. So Foodio at Coffee and Tea, will that be basically the same thing here or will, will that be a twist on what you're doing in Tappahannock? It'll be a twist. So we're going to have those, a few vendor spaces available. Um, so local products, sustainable products. And we're also going to keep the coffee shop side. Um, so my dad and I actually have owned and operated a convenience store right across from Foodio uh, since 2012. Mm. Um, and that is known for its barbecue and fried chicken. So there's a full-fledged kitchen. It's more like a country store that, you know, great food. Um, so Ashland Coffee and Tea will have the coffee, we'll have the tea, we'll have a kitchen, mostly breakfast and pastries. And then we'll have those vendor spaces as well. Oh, okay. Really cool. Are the vendors preparing anything or are they just selling uh, the food that they bring in? A little bit of, you mean preparing things in the kitchen? Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, they'll be bringing things in. Okay. Yeah. So it's like an indoor farmer's market, essentially. Yes. Okay. That's really cool. Thank you. Uh, we talked about a bushel of crabs potentially someday. And yes. You said not going to be in Foodio, but you could connect me to somebody. Yes. We do have a vendor that sells crabs and a ton of other seafood, so... But she's not bringing, he or she's not bringing the crabs to Foodio. No, probably. but I imagine she would meet you somewhere. Okay. All right. <laughs> where, did not, the, where did the name come from? Foodio? Yeah. So originally I was a food blogger. So I would review restaurants and festivals. I would do judging at like mostly barbecue competitions, also uh, pastry competitions, like usually cookies, sometimes cakes. Um, and the name, my name was Jamie L. So Jamie L, the blogger or whatever. Um, and people kept getting the name wrong, <laughs> so they kept calling it Foodio, and it was like a year of that, and finally I was like, I'll just change it to Foodio. Wow, yeah. went with the flow. Mm -hmm. I like it. I've got a friend who does barbecue um, judging. It's a big deal, is it not? It is. It's I mean, intense. It's, yeah. And I, there was one competition where a guy got really upset. I mean, and what he made was good. He just didn't win, and he got pretty livid. <laughs> he should it's probably be, he should be out of the competition business. Like, if yeah. you can't handle a loss, you shouldn't compete. And it was his first competition. Oh. So, and when he got upset, I was thinking, well, maybe he's done this a number of times and he just can't get a break. It was his first competition. And uh, if the other person hadn't been there, he would have won. How old of a person? Not sure. I would say somewhere between 35 and 40. Too old for that kind of behavior. <laughs> All right, so how, you, you're from, you grew up, part of your childhood in Tappahannock where else did you grow up so originally from Tappahannock then we moved to Mechanicsville uh, then we moved back to Tappahannock <laughs> and then we moved to Richmond then Henrico okay and but, you're you're living in Henrico now no actually I live in Bumpus middle of yes nowhere. that's one of my favorite names <laughs> that is and, no one can and you get did it right. <laughs> and you did you did pronounce it correctly yes it's not the she other there. no I, well sure <laughs> well does everybody in Bumpus pronounce it correctly I don't know. Hmm. <laughs> Maggie off mic seemed confident that everybody pronounces it that way. I would <laughs> question if newcomers pronounced it correctly. <laughs> right. They don't. I promise. All right. So you've lived in a lot of places in and around Ashland, but you've chosen to come to Ashland with uh, Foodia. Why Ashland? It's just the cutest town. So as a kid, so my dad always lived in Tappahannock. He still lives in Tappahannock. 
and we would come up to Virginia Center Commons, come up to Ashland, and I just always thought it was the cutest town um, and a genuine town. Um, I went to college at Shenandoah for a year and a half, then transferred into Macon. And I used to go to Ashton Coffee and Tea and look at it all the time and just daydream. I never thought I would own it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to own it, but I never thought I actually could. And a deal became available kind of quickly and surprisingly, but I was like, yeah, I got to take it. That's awesome. That is great. Yeah, Yeah, so why Randolph-Macon? Why did I go there? Mm -hmm. Um, They had a good science program. So I was interested in pharmacy initially, which is why I went to Shenandoah, and got into it and realized I just didn't want to count pills for the rest of my life. Um, Nothing against it, it's just not what I wanted to do. I wanted to make medicine. Um, And so Macon had a very good science program, so chemistry and biology, both things I was majoring in. And my now wife was going to Macon, so I got a good introduction into Macon, like a hands-on seeing what it's like, seeing how the professors really cared, and loved it, loved the people there, and transferred in when you say cute what what pops in your head it's like the town you see in the hallmark movies like the christmas movies that's ashland okay we talked about that earlier the the movie um sleeping with the enemy which is not it's not a cute movie (laughs) at all but but where she goes to get away that little town it's very you know yeah I, I think Ashland's kind of similar to that town. It'd be pretty cool. I can agree with that part. Okay. But yeah, it's not a cute movie at all. I think of the movie theater when I think of Ashland being cute. Gotcha. And downtown. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very cool. What's the biggest challenge you've had to overcome uh, running Foodia? Doing it alone. Um, so I have support of my family, um, I guess, verbally and emotionally, but a lot of it boils down to just doing it yourself. So I grow a lot of the food. I bake all of the baked goods. Um, we do have one baked good vendor, but totally different style. Um, and just figuring it out. I mean, there's a ton of information out there about starting a business, but until you actually start a business and get into the weeds of it, you realize just how much information is not there. So I'm grateful to have my dad and a great aunt who own businesses that have helped guide me along, but they are different than what I do. So just figuring it out and also getting funding. <laughs> so. <laughs> What's your fondest memory of running the business? Having customers that couldn't read or write and quite literally believe that they would have been better off enslaved, mm. understand food better, and, and really take away the food education, perhaps sometimes learn to read or learn to pay their own bills, um, and even grow something on their own. Wow. So. Wow, I was right. Yeah. When you say grow, are we talking about several acres? Are we saying like a backyard garden kind of thing? So one of the things we educate on is growing food anywhere. So um, I actually am disabled myself. I have a messed up arm. Um, And so it's important to me to have people be able to grow no matter what circumstance they're in. So if you're receiving SNAP, which is formerly food stamps, being able to use that to purchase seed and supplies and maybe growing your windowsill um, to growing on a farm. Um, so we have 10 acres and then another acre elsewhere. Um, and we're able to grow pretty much everything that way. So being able to teach that to our customers um, and who grow literally in their windowsills and sometimes in their backyards. Uh, great and and they can learn to sustain themselves mm-hmm. with that. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't take much. Um, there's Virginia State University oh. did a study, I guess it's been 10 or 15 years ago, on one acre farming and how you could either sustain a family of, I think it was four or six, I think it was four, or earn a sizable income just from one acre growing the right things. Mm. And so we took that model and kind of shrunk it down a little bit because a lot of people don't have one acre, but seeing just how far you could take that. What what are a couple things on that list? That you could grow? Yeah, that Uh, that are profitable or you could sustain a family, what what would you say? So what are called specialty crops, Mm -hmm. um, which is really any fruit or vegetable, but namely uh, seedless blackberries, Swiss chard, different varieties of tomatoes, so not like your run-of-the-mill tomato, but any of the different colors or acidity levels, um, different varieties of peppers, and leaving out things like corn that take up a ton of space. Like people like corn, but you don't get a lot of money for corn. And it takes up a ton of space. And it's scary. <laughs> it's a little scary. <laughs> corn stalks you're talking about. Corn, like corn a field, field of yeah. cornfield. Yeah, yeah, it can be scary. 
You may watch a lot of scary movies. I, apparently, I do. Ke- <laughs> Kevin's a little punchy right now. I think. Uh, you got anything? Well, so I, we have a question we wanted to ask around what's going to be new for you, but I think we've we've answered that. But uh, anything else that uh, you have planned in the, over the next twelve months or so? Potentially adding donuts. I've always wanted to offer donuts, and in college we did Relay for Life, and I did I think three events where I sold donuts, um, and I loved it. It was a ton of work, but I loved it. And actually, just last week I had someone say, "Hey, I had your donut like ten years ago. <laughs> it was really good." But I think now that I have the space and the right location, I would like to in the next twelve months add that. And I think Ashland deserves a good donut place. Yeah, they do. Why are donuts so hard? It's a lot of time. So it's making the dough, kneading it down, waiting, then doing it again. Then you actually form your shapes, depending on what kind of donut you're making. Then you bake it or wow. fry it, depending on. What's your favorite donut? donut? Bavarian cream. Mmm. That's what I'm talking mm-hmm. about. And but, real cream, not the white cream that's sometimes in there. Yeah. What's your favorite meal? Corned beef and cabbage. I did not see that coming. Yeah, yeah. No one does. I'm not a big cabbage fan. I don't like cabbage, <laughs> but for some reason, corned corn beef, beef and cabbage, I like it together. Okay. So yeah. where would you go get a donut? Country style on mm. Williamsburg Road. Yep, I know exactly Sketchy donuts, but yep. delicious. Yeah. <laughs> sketchy location for where you get the donuts, or are we saying the donuts themselves mm. are sketchy? A little both. Okay. Little both. Interesting. Huh? <laughs> not a knock to them, but my dad always said that scary food is often good food, so. Should we explore that? that? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> not unless you're prepared to go to the hospital. <laughs> so you went to Randolph-Macon, but you also work there. Yes. What, what do you do at Randolph-Macon? I'm the program coordinator for church relations. So we have multiple programs for high school students that also bridge with college students on varying things. So we have one that just ended called Valuing the Voices in Our Church, which is a year-long program, well, school year-long program. And it's for ninth, 10th, I'm sorry, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. And it's basically on leadership, diversity, and call. Not necessarily call meaning becoming a pastor, but call meaning what you want to do and how your faith may tie into that. We also have Convergence, which is going on right now. Um, And that is a faith and science camp, which is just usually nine days during the summer, but this year is virtual, so it's a little bit different. How does the word get out about that? Lots of on the road time. So Mm -hmm. literally making calls to churches and youth ministers, um, going out on the road and just passing out flyers, meeting with churches. Um, and Macon has a decent amount of clergy who, or people who graduate to become clergy. Okay. I did not know that. Yeah. It's the okay. oldest United Methodist college in the country. Did not know that either. Yep. Okay. Well, look at that. Other fun facts about Macon? You're teaching us stuff. Uh, not that I could think of. It's lemon and black, not yellow and black. Lemon? <laughs> lemon. Who would choose lemon? Randolph or Macon, I guess. <laughs> that, that's, that, lemon's actually a color? I guess. I'm actually colorblind, so I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> really? But you knew that. You knew that's a color. Awesome. You knew, it's you knew, ingrained. You knew a color you get or fact. That is great. <laughs> that's, uh, I did not see that coming. So should they be the lemon jackets? <laughs> that's a fair question. <laughs> that's a fair question. Uh, ten years from now, what's going on in your life? As it relates to Foodio in particular, and then in general. I would love to have a Foodio in every small community. Um, So in every small food insecure community. How many of those are in Virginia? Honestly, I don't know. Um, Virginia is a rather food insecure place, but one in six people is food insecure. So you could easily say almost every county. Food insecure meaning they don't know where their next meal is coming from? Yes. At any given time? Yes. It's got to be a very scary way to live. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're below the poverty line either. A lot of people don't think about that. It could be that maybe you've had a bad year, and maybe you made six figures last year, but this year you're making significantly less. But sometimes there's a gap. You know, sometimes, like, say, say you're just graduated from college, and you have a job, but maybe your job doesn't start for two months. That's a little gap Mm -hmm. of being food insecure, and there's really no help unless you've had a prolonged issue, but you can't quite make it to that first paycheck. And that could totally throw off someone's entire life or at least 10, 15 years of their life. Right. Yeah. When I think of food insecurity, I think of inner city, mm-hmm. larger cities, but I think you're saying it's can be anywhere. Yep. Yeah. And there's probably more in the rural areas than we, we understand. Yeah. And people will often think, especially with Tappahannock, I mean, it's a farming community. That's the number one 
industry there, but most of that food that's grown is not actually food. It's usually fuel or feed for animals. Mm. Most of that is sent to Japan. So you're in a place that you would think there's tons of food, but there's really not. Yeah, there's a lot being shipped out of that part of the uh, the state, yep. the, the Middle Peninsula, and I guess the Northern Neck as well. Yeah. Wow. Uh, do you have fond memories of growing up um, in Tappahannock? I do. Um, the river is a big part of our culture. There's, uh, oddly enough, not a ton of river access, but still we have River Fest. We try as much to go fishing or do something on the water. Um, but also it's just most of my family is there or was there at some point. So You love seafood? I do. Favorite seafood? Crabs, blue crabs. Blue I don't crab. care about crab legs, but yeah, crab crabs. legs are from a different ocean, right? They are. Yeah, yeah. Blue crabs are the best tasting crabs in the world. I agree. And picking them is a lot of fun. I uh, thank you. A lot of people say like, "Oh, that's just work." I'm like, "You have to work for good stuff." Yeah, <laughs> and, and it's actually fun. That yeah. that kind of work is fun. It's yeah. a social thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, so, <laughs> if you have spare time, what are you doing? Typically, either baking, um, which arguably could be considered work, but I enjoy trying new recipes, or comic books, like collecting comic books, reading comic books. What's your favorite? Batman. Oh. Yeah. So I'm not a big comic book guy, but is that that's DC? Mm-hmm. It is. Marvel's been crushing lately, at least in the movie theaters. They have. Why is that? Personal opinion, I feel like because DC does a ton of origin stories, it seems like like even with Batman, there's been a ton of Batman movies yeah. or Joker movies. And every time it's an origin story. They never really continue. They're not maturing than, their character. Same yeah. story. Yeah. Or, and they'll completely redo it at times. So it gets a bit confusing. Um, with, I would say with the exception of the Dark Knight series, that continued. But it's just three movies. Whereas Marvel will start something, continue it for forever, and then put it in other movies. Hmm. So I'm not a Marvel fan, but they do a good job with their storylines. So what, what DC Comics should be a movie that, that you haven't seen yet? Hmm. Or it hasn't come out yet as a movie? That's a good question. I have no idea. <laughs> we'll get that on the next episode of this podcast. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, what are your hours going to be at Foodie M? Wednesday through Saturday, 7.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. Okay. Why is that? Why, why no Monday, Tuesday? Uh, mostly because I work at the college, so it'll be <laughs> she has, a, she has another job. Hard. That makes sense. Yeah. I thought there might be a, you know some research you did. Oh. Monday no. and Tuesday doesn't work. Okay. Not that fancy. <laughs> <laughs> I do think that we'll expand hours later, but I want to be consistent and make sure we're doing well before oh, yeah. I start big and Total do sense. too much. What's the vibe going to be like in there? Somewhere between Ashland Coffee and Tea, early 2000s, and your typical farmer's market. Okay. Or but maybe I should say Amish market. Amish? What's the difference? Um, I don't know if you've ever been to the Upper Marlboro uh, Amish market. It's indoor, hmm. but it's huge. It's like the size of a food line, if not bigger. And it's a ton of different vendors in the center. But around the perimeter, it's all Amish-made things from cooked food, like fresh prepared there, to baked goods, pickles. Um, and that was actually my inspiration as far as what Foodio would be. Um, so the vibe there is kind of like going into a upbeat coffee shop, but also a place like a food world, like where you can taste and see almost anything. That's oh. really, that's a great concept. Yeah. G- going to be hard to achieve, maybe. In that space, probably, but I mean, I have dreams. How big is this space? It's 5,500 square feet. Okay. But a portion of it is now center of the universe. So we rent to them, um, which it Another used to be music name. space. Okay. So, yeah. what, what happens in Center of the Universe? Uh, they sell yarn. <laughs> <laughs> I walked right into that one. Sorry. I was going to say. <laughs> but they also teach classes, um, several different classes. And I got roped into wanting to sign up for one because they had something that was super cute. And I was like, ah, I can't sew anything. But now I'm going to take two classes because you have to take an intro class. to get to. They're very good at what they do. What's the cute thing you want to make? It's some Japanese stuffed animal, and you have to learn to make the owl before you can make the thing I can't pronounce. And it's all with yarn? <laughs> all with yarn. I can't wrap my head around that. I have no idea how it's going to happen. My mom can't sew worth beans. I love her to death, but she can't, so I'm pretty certain I'm not going to be able to do it. Does your mom think she can? No. Okay, so she's no, aware. She knows, she, knows she can't sew yeah. buttons. All right, bar- you mentioned barbecue earlier. <laughs> yes. Uh, tomato or vinegar-based? Both. Really? Yes. Do you have a preference? It depends on the day. Okay. But 
probably typically tomato um, and at Sunnyside, so um, my dad's business. He sold the same barbecue for about close to 30 years. Um, and it's tomato based, but it's not sweet. Mm. It's like the perfect marriage of Virginia style with a with a kick. Savory mm-hmm. and, and a little sweet. Just a little bit. Okay, very cool. Yeah. What can our listeners uh, do to help uh, food insecure people or uh, areas around them? One of the biggest things is if you donate to a food bank, consider what you're donating. So sometimes you'll get fresh produce there and your food bank may not open until Saturday and the produce is donated on Tuesday. It might sit out that whole time. So by the time the person gets it, it's rotten. Um, You see that a lot when grocery stores donate. I don't think it's their fault. They don't necessarily know when the day is, but if it's already past date when they're getting it and then, you know, it's kind of icky. The other thing is staples are really important, so like rice, flour, beans, um, peanut butter, like things like that. People can use that for to create almost anything. That's actually one of our classes is being able to go into your pantry and kind of chop style create something. Um, add to that donating recipes because there's a lot of people who don't know how to cook, and actually that was something I grew up with. We had, I would say, a very large portion of our food came from the food bank or local churches. And we would often get things we had no idea what it was. And my mom and grandmother were progressive in that they were willing to try it. But, you know, a lot of times it turned out to be something that you would probably never want to eat again or you just really didn't know what it was. And there was a mm-hmm. summer where we had apricots constantly. <laughs> so, wow. yeah. yeah. Do you like apricots? I do not. <laughs> <laughs> what if it was with corned beef? No. What? You couldn't that. pay me to get paper So what do we need to do as a country to uh, rid ourselves of food insecure parts of the country? Grow something of your own if you can, and check on your neighbors. Um, you can have a person living right next door to you and never know that they're missing meals. Hmm. That's a great piece of advice. Yeah. Check on your neighbors not only for that, for anything. Yeah. Yeah. But be, I like that. Be neighborly. Yeah. 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 Tons it, of people don't know their neighbors. I know. At all. And it's gotten worse since the pandemic, too. Yeah. What's the pandemic been like for you? Surprisingly, it helped. Um, And I think part of it was we decided not to be in person at all. Um, A good portion of our customers at that time were older, so we switched to delivery. Um, And oddly enough, the delivery model really grew business. So we have triple the amount of members now. um, And delivery just really helped. I mean, I think it was convenient to people. Um, I think people are going to miss it um, because for the next year, I'm not going to be able to do that part, but I would love to add it back. Just because you're going to be focused on your physical location. Mm -hmm. Very cool. How many vendors do you think you're going to get in there? I don't know. Um, Initially, I was thinking 10, but I've had at least one or two people call every day since we and that was just last Tuesday um so I think it may end up being that we might have to have vendor Saturdays or something where people can set up outside Mm. which is a good problem it's a great problem I was at a farmer's market a couple Saturdays ago I won't say where because my next comment is going to be not so positive and out of maybe 12 vendors only one was food that's becoming more and more common um and there's a market that I used to go to, and the reason I stopped is because it's now all craft vendors. I have no issues with crafts. Right. That's, that's a crafts person's market, not, yeah. not a farmer's market. Yeah. And I go, I want, like, the local honey and the odd produce. And so, yeah, I would like a balance. And ours is a balance. We specifically try not to have competing vendors. So you can very well, like I bake, so I mostly do cakes and pies. We have a vendor that does dog treats and cookies. She makes amazing cakes. But to be in the same space, I don't want us to compete with each other. So I try to make sure not to book people that do the exact same thing, but also allow them to have information there to say, we also do X, Y, and Z. And you're booking people like for three Wednesdays in a row sort of thing? Or you like, how, how often does a, a particular vendor come to, your, to Foodia? It's up to them. It's on a weekly basis. It's incredibly cheap. Um, but we encourage people to stay for at least a month. Most people do, just so people can get used to seeing Mm -hmm. them, seeing what they have. Maybe they came on the first week, they didn't have enough money, third week they did. Um, So typically they'll sign up for a month and they usually end up staying at least a year. 
So Wednesday, Saturday for a month, try it, and then mm -hmm. see how you like it. Yep. And they typically stay for a year. Typically. Okay. And when they move on, why are they moving on? A lot of times they've grown their business and they just need more, either more time or more space. Sometimes, actually more often than not, they'll keep both. So they'll stay in the market, but now they have like a full-fledged business somewhere else. Maybe they'll do other markets. Maybe they'll get a food truck. Um, sometimes they'll just sell out of their house, but they now have regular clientele. Mm. So uh, what you're providing is an incubator of sorts. Pretty much, yeah. And we also do education on helping them learn how to start a business if they want to go further or just make it more safe, like instead of it being a sole proprietorship, being an LLC, which protects you legally. You're a very giving person based on oh. what we've talked about. Where does Thank that come you. from? I would say my parents. Uh, my parents and my grandmother. So my grandmother raised me. Um, and my dad always, my dad and my grandmother always taught me to help in any way you can. Um, and my mom is also very much the same. So that's, that's amazing. It's that's awesome. Thank you. When are you opening? Next Wednesday. So August that's fast. 4th. It is very fast. Wow. And I apparently had lost my mind and thought I could do this Thursday. <laughs> um, but next Wednesday. It's a soft opening. So it won't be fully every single thing, but will at least be open. Um, open to the public. Mm -hmm. I would say grand opening probably first week of October. Do you need any uh, taste testers? I'm always open to taste testers. <laughs> hey, that's I'm for in. that's for both of us. Yeah. yeah. Stop by next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. What what are the times again? Next Wednesday it'll be four to seven for the soft opening. Okay. But other than that, every week it'll be Wednesday through Saturday, seven thirty a.m. to two p.m. Tell us more about your family. They're eclectic. <laughs> we like that. Is that, a, is that a good thing? I like them. <laughs> <laughs> it's good that you like your family. It is good. It's not always the case, so it's good. <laughs> no, it's different. Um, my parents separated when I was two. Um, but I spent, I would say, about equal amount of time with both sides of the family. So my dad's adopted. We have, he's adopted, but he was adopted by his grandmother. And he had six siblings. They all got split up. Mm. Um, so, but they keep in contact with each other, and they have the coolest Thanksgivings. So our Thanksgivings are the whole family, and then everyone brings something. So it's everything from traditional turkey and mashed potatoes to lasagna. How many people? Um, whew, it's smaller now than it used to be, but somewhere between fifty and sixty wow. people. That's a lot. Yeah. It's good. It do you rent a place out, or where do you go? No, my great aunt has it, and she adopted um, my dad's sister, um, so my aunt, um, and it's at her house, and we're all sitting on top of each other, and it's amazing, awesome. and we're full, and it's it's great. And you look forward to it every year. Yep. What about Christmas? What do y'all do for Christmas? Christmas, we have. Well, my dad started having because my parents separated. He started having Christmas breakfast at his house. So we have that every year. It's mostly immediate family and friends and people in the community. Um, and then three days after Christmas, which is actually my birthday, oh. we have a big family gift exchange. Um, and so not exactly traditional Christmas dinner, I guess, but still very good. Um, like I like that it's, it's kind of like our Thanksgiving, like everyone brings something different, kind of like a potluck. Um, my mom's side, she's originally from Charles City and so that side is, um, I don't know, I would almost say hunter-gatherers in a way, and not mm. at all in a, in a mean way, but like we have everything from rabbit to oh. squirrel and turkey. I mean, it's, Grew up hunting because that's how you, you got food. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay, very cool. And tell us a little bit more about your wife. So she used to work at Randolph-Macon. She just started working at the Valentine Museum, uh, downtown Richmond. Um, she is very supportive. <laughs> I'm sure she gets tired of hearing about all my ideas in the middle of the night. So <laughs> very supportive. <laughs> That's awesome. You kind of need that, right? Because you're, you're an entrepreneur. Yes, yes. What's the best part about being an entrepreneur? Um, being able to just imagine something and potentially see it come to fruition. It doesn't always, but just being able to try it without someone saying, no, you can't do that. Yeah, innovation, everybody thinks they're innovative because they mm -hmm. came up with an idea. That's 5% of innovation. Mm -hmm. the, actually getting it done is the other 95%. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the hard part. Well, yeah. I, I am very happy that I met you today. Thank you so much for being on our podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank yes. you so much for having me. Thank you for listening. 
If you enjoy this episode, please subscribe to wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd also really appreciate if you'd rate and review us. You can find us at scodopodcast.com. Thank you.